Uh, hello, this is uh, lecture 25. Uh, we're going to be talking about <clears throat> some of the recent research that's been done uh, in the area of visual processing, namely uh, the work of uh, Mortimer Mishkin, who has traced some of the important pathways that are involved in uh, um, uh, visual processing. In other words, they've kind of taken things uh, a few steps forward uh, from the work of uh, Hubel and Wiesel that we talked about in our previous lecture. And uh, what I'll also be doing is talking about the <clears throat> really interesting work of uh, Nancy Canwisher and Leslie Ungerleiter uh, in the area of face recognition. So these will be our, uh, our principal topics um, in this uh, lecture today, which will, uh, again, explore, um, you know, some of the methodology that uh, that they use in order to to make the important discoveries um, uh, that they have made. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Mortimer Mishkin. He's a behavioral neuroscientist who was a real leader in terms of trying to further understand the pathways that are involved, not only in vision, but also in hearing and in touch. Uh, and his work really has been considered to be some of the most important uh, in the area uh, of what I would call the modern era of, um, of uh, research uh, in the area of, of vision. So what he does is he's studying those what we call processing streams in the brain. Um, and they're ones that uh, are involved not only um, in basic visual uh, processing, but also play an important role in other things like memory, uh, for example. So <clears throat> the, the single most important thing that you need to know about Mishkin's work is that he's identified three primary pathways uh, in the brain for visual processing. So, <clears throat> You know, recall the work of Huvel and Wiesel, where they're, they're finding these very specialized cells in the striated cortex uh, that respond uh, to different orientations uh, of, a, of an object. And um, beyond that, however, you didn't really understand what was happening, you know, at the next level. You know, what happens in terms of uh, trying to integrate that information. And uh, again, Mortimer Mishkin identifies these three different pathways. Um, uh, uh, and his work uh, really takes uh, the work of uh, Hugh Bell and Wiesel to, to the next level. So um, the first pathway is one that he calls a, a magnocellular, or mostly magnocellular neuron pathway. And again, take a look um, at this area in the back of the brain. Okay, this is the... Uh, uh, a striated cortex uh, that you see here, the occipital lobe that you see here. And this is what in the yellow is called the vision one area and the purple, this is the vision two area. So that information then is, is going to go to a couple of different places. Um, uh, this, this magnocellular neuron pathway, um, it is going to go in this dorsal branch uh, that you see right here. Um, uh, it's, it's going to be involved with integrating um, uh, uh, vision and, and action. This pathway that you see right here, <clears throat> uh, which is going to the parietal um, uh, lobe uh, area, uh, we would call this the ventral branch, uh, is very sensitive to movement. Uh, so this uh, magnocellular neuron pathway then is going to a couple of places. Again, it's going to the posterior parietal cortex that you see right here, and it's also going um, to um, uh, this area um, that you see right here uh, that's involved in um, uh, um, uh, movement uh, and uh, movement perception. Uh, so, uh, again, that's the, the first pathway. The second pathway is one that's mixed. It contains two different types of neurons, uh, the mag magnocellular neurons and paracellular uh, neurons. Uh, so this pathway goes from the vision one area. Again, this is the original area that was studied, the V1 and V2 areas of the striated cortex that was studied by Hugh Bell and Wiesel. And what he finds in this mixed pathway um, is um, the, 
uh, information is, is going here uh, to the temporal lobe area. It's going from V1 to V2 and then the vision 4 area and then uh, the posterior inferior temporal cortex. So what we know from this pathway is that um, uh, it's all about you know regulating brightness and color uh, and shape. The third pathway is one uh, that he calls the parvocellular neuron pathway. Uh, and what we know from this uh, is that uh, that information again, you know, initially goes to the striate cortical areas, the V1 and V2 area, uh, then the V4 area, but then it's going to uh, the inferior temporal cortex that you see here. Um, and this is where um, uh, details uh, of shape uh, are dissected. Um, so again, these are the three principal pathways that, that he uh, identifies. And again, he has taken this work, you know, another step beyond um, the work of Huvel and Wiesel. Um, another key researcher here, um, even more recently, uh, two key researchers, uh, Nancy Canwisher and Leslie Ungerleiter, who you see uh, there, they've been taking a look at the phenomena of what we call face recognition. And what they have been able to find is that there's an area um, of the uh, uh, temporal lobe, which is called the fusiform gyrus, and it's in the pink that you see right here. And um, uh, Can Wisher uh, and Ungerleiter believe that this area is involved in how we go about recognizing uh, faith. So if we back up a little bit, it's a piece of research that I want to talk about first uh, that's considered to be um, you know, a classic piece of research in the field of psychology by uh, R. Alphonse. Uh, in which he found in infants, some as young as about three months of age, um, uh, that they recognize what a human face looks like. And here's what they did. Uh, one at a time, they would show these infants these faces. Uh, this is uh, what we would call a scrambled face. Here's another scrambled face. This is a normal face. And what they do is um, they present these faces to an infant that's lying on its back. And so the face is placed above them and they measure how much time the infant spends looking at these faces. And what Fonz finds is that um, the face that you see here is um, viewed the most. Uh, and they do this by way of measuring uh, preferences, that is uh, uh, how much time they spend actually gazing at this face. And they spend a lot less time looking at these scrambled faces. So this convinced Fonts that there's uh, you know, some kind of an innate mechanism there that allows uh, an infant to recognize what a human face looks like. So this was some of the first research in the area of face uh, recognition. Uh, and uh, again, if you trace what is happening in terms of, um, you know, our visual field uh, and what happens in terms of uh, brain activity, uh, you know, one of the things that we know is that that information by way of the optic nerve uh, is going to both uh, hemispheres uh, of the brain. Uh, so again, the right eye is processing information by way of the uh, right optic nerve area that's going to the right hemisphere, but it's also going to the left hemisphere. And again, here's the optic chiasm that we identified earlier. Um, and the information that is coming from uh, the left eye is uh, going not only to the left hemisphere, but also to the, to the right hemisphere. Uh, but, and again, that information is terminating here in the striate cortex in the back of the brain. Um, and uh, if you take a look um, at vision, um, about 40% of the brain is involved with the processing of visual stimuli. So there's over 40 different receiving points in the brain for visual stimuli. That's a lot. So a lot of your brain is really occupied with um, uh, visual uh, processing. 
Uh, if you take a look uh, at this figure here, again, here's the human brain, here's the frontal area right here. Uh, the parietal lobe that you see right here um, is uh, very much involved in determining where things are in space. And again, if you go back and you take a look at the research of Mortimer Mishkin, that helps us to, to understand that. Um, when you take a look um, at the temporal lobe, um, the temporal lobe that you see right here is telling us what kind of objects we are looking at. So again, the very important functions um, of those two lobes of the brain in terms of processing visual information. Now, Ken Wisher and Ungerweider have taken a look um, at the left temporal lobe. And what they do is they show uh, pictures of faces uh, to subjects and they measure neural activity that's occurring in the left temporal lobe. And you can see this uh, yellow um, um, uh, enclosed area right here. That's an awful lot of activity when an individual is showing a face. And if they also measure what is happening uh, in terms of the you know, electrical activity of the brain, you get these very strong responses that are occurring uh, in response to a face that you don't uh, ordinarily see in terms of uh, electrical uh, activity of the brain. You only see it in that area of the left temporal lobe. So again, whenever you view a face, you get this you know, electrical activity that's occurring, this neural activity uh, that you see in terms of measuring what is happening, and it's only in the left temporal lobe area. Um, so neural responses to faces of different types and different orientations, you know, if you take a look at these uh, pictures that you see here, these are all pictures that provoke those neural responses to occur uh, in human beings, okay, in the uh, left temporal lobe uh, area. Uh, so uh, whole faces or parts of faces, one of the things that we know is uh, the eyes are particularly important. Uh, if you just show, uh, you know, part of a face and it includes the eyes, uh, you still get those very strong responses uh, in the temporal lobe area in terms of neural activity. Um, so, uh, you know, what is it in terms of, um, you know, what is happening here? Um, you know, this is not something that you get a neural response to uh, when you, uh, in the left temporal lobe area, when you show it to a human being. Um, but this is something that you get responses to. And you should note that this is simply this figure here inverted, right? So the more it begins looking like a face and the contours of face, the greater is the likelihood that you're going to get a response that occurs in that part. Uh, so in view of that very important work done by uh, Canwisher and Ungerleiter, you know, think about it. We're looking at faces all the time. And again, here's that fusiform gyrus that you see right here that apparently is involved in this face recognition. Lots of neural activity when we see a face. Um, and um, indeed, we look at those faces all the time. We determine who a person is. We determine uh, gender uh, from faces. We determine whether or not that individual is friendly to us or maybe not so friendly to us. Uh, and uh, we're getting feedback uh, all the time. And that feedback is exerting an impact upon the brain and indeed maybe viewing faces and that feedback that we get from viewing faces may actually change uh, the structure of the brain. But there are many who believe that um, face recognition is, is so important, so crucial uh, for our survival that uh, perhaps uh, this is something that has been that has evolved by way of natural selection uh, that will allow us to recognize faces to, uh, from a very very early time in our life. So I think that many in this area lean towards there being a very strong genetic predisposition uh, to uh, recognizing what a human face looks like. So uh, our conclusions in this area, you know, we're, we're making very powerful advances. New technology is helping us to do that. We're making new discoveries all the time. 
uh, in terms of visual processing. And certainly that work in the area of face recognition is, is way out in front uh, in terms of helping us uh, to understand um, this very, very important part uh, of our everyday, uh, our everyday uh, existence. So that kind of wraps up that lecture, and uh, our next one we'll be taking a look at our sense of smell, in which there's some really fascinating um, new information uh, out there that indicates that uh, uh, this is uh, something that may be involved in attraction uh, and uh, how we go about selecting uh, mates. So uh, we'll take a look at that uh, in our next class.